The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. I'm Everybody and welcome to the Crashing Glass Podcast. I'm your host, Holly Hurley, here as always with my co-host, Jill Henley. Hi, you, Jill. Hi, Holly. And this week we have a very special chick joining us for a Chick's Health episode. So, you know, hike up those girls, ladies. We're going to talk about stuff that's comfortable, stuff that's uncomfortable. And we're going to talk about it with our uh, doctor of physical therapy, Cecily DiStefano. Welcome back, Cecily. Thank you, Holly. And thank you, Jill, for having me. Oh, it's All great. Right. So, Cecily, what are some of the issues you would say that are sort of uh, more prominent in women that you see? Well, um, we were talking before the show started, uh, hip issues are becoming a a big topic in women's health these days. A lot of women are are newly being diagnosed with uh, labral tears and uh, hip dysfunctions as well as pelvic pelvic floor dysfunctions, uh, bowel and bladder and sexual dysfunctions, uh, sacroiliac joint issues uh, are coming up as we as we become more active and uh, longer in our lifespan i mean women are now living to well into their 90s and we're active you know uh, a lot of times well into that time period uh, over 70 so uh, we definitely have more of these kinds of issues coming to the forefront forefront is you know along with other female athlete issues um as well you know there's a there's a lot of books out right now with female athletes soccer players uh, specifically between the ages of 11 to 13 they start to develop uh, different growth issues as their bones start to grow and their muscles are anxiously trying to catch up and they're doing some high level sports travel sports and things like that so um, we get into some biomechanical things related to running and and those types of issues which we covered before and and now you know as we're becoming better educated on our breast health and we're doing mammograms hopefully to avoid mastectomies earlier in our lives and, and we're catching breast cancer and things like that that becomes an issue as well uh, treating that and preventing that and as well as things like lymphedema pregnancy obviously and, and postpartum and, and obviously prepartum too now we're trying to catch people before they get pregnant and prepare their bodies for pregnancy so that um, they'll have an easier time physically with regard to their back and, and other other things bone health, osteoporosis, and, and those types of issues. And chronic pain is becoming a big one. With 116 to 160 million people having chronic pain and women being uh, primarily 75% of those, we, we talk a lot about that population in women's health these days. Cool. So that sounds like quite a plethora of things. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long list. <laughs> Now, Jill, you you had a specific question for Cecily this week, actually. I did. Well, I guess my my first question for you, Cecily, is about the soccer injuries that you're seeing in girls, you know, said between ages 11 to 13. Um, And I wondered what other sports besides soccer are you see prominent injuries? And do you think it's related to just the this the extreme you know, early start now, I mean, I say extreme because kids start playing organized sports, particularly soccer, at three years old. And so because we have that whole shift of kids going organized and and specifying, you know, their sports early, do you think that contributes to some of this injury? There is some there is some research out there to show that 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 you know with kids starting earlier and playing harder and being specialized sooner, as you very well said, that you know that can contribute to some of the the dysfunction and the overuse, more the overuse injuries really. Um, other sports, you know, I, not to pick on soccer because it's a great sport. It's it's done a lot for um, for women, um, and we've we've been you know really really doing great in that sport. Also basketball, we see some knee injuries regarding specific knee injuries because every sport has its own, you know, prominence and some sports are biased to have more frequently injuries of certain kinds like swimmers are more prone to having shoulder injuries and basketball players are more prone to having uh, a lot of women knee injuries as well as soccer. Um, but, but some of it is just, you know, kind of learning how to take care of your body because we can also improve our performance uh, by taking care of some of these biomechanical things earlier. You know, as we talked about before, if you, I, I worked with the WAGS program here in Northern Virginia, uh, Washington soccer, uh, organized Washington soccer around here in Northern Virginia. And 
And if, if we do some things between the ages of 11 to 13 to sort of prevent those kinds of things from happening, and also we find that there's a correlation between getting, getting people's biomechanics in line and um, getting them on a plan of how to kind of move the body, their performance improves. We were talking about women's soccer and, and between the ages of 11 and 13, how women are starting to develop and their bones are growing and hormones are changing and their muscles are anxiously trying to catch up. And at the same time, we really start to ramp up our sports play. And sometimes there's a correlation between, you know, biomechanics and, and kids getting to know their new bodies and, and that growth and injuries. And the, but there's also a correlation if we get these things worked out, their performance improves. So they can vastly improve their performance by just kind of working on those biomechanics and getting their knees in alignment, feet in alignment, and their hips in alignment. Uh, during during those sports. So, I mean, obviously these are, um, what are some of the ways that especially, you know, mothers out there who have these younger female athletes can start preparing their daughters for, uh, for sports? You know, I mean, all of us want to be active and we want our kids to be active for life. What's a good start? Well, I think, I think the main thing is just kind of starting out with play really and, and keeping your kids active in the off season, but, but diversifying a little bit. So not necessarily playing, you know, 20 different soccer teams, but throw in a little bit of swimming in there, you know, just to keep their endurance up, keep them active and, and have them doing some different sports so that they're diversifying a little bit. So they're not just doing the same thing, banging it over and over and over in the off season and the on season and playing travel. And um, cause some of that definitely contributes to the, to the injury rate. Well, that's good to know. Are there any other um, sort of frequent injuries that you see for women uh, that come from sports? We talked a little bit about, about uh, shoulder injuries. So you see in swimmers uh, who, who do a lot of swimming, sometimes they'll get, they'll get some shoulder injuries. And that's the other thing going back you know, to what we were saying is the mechanics are pretty important. So you can't just look at you know, how, to, how to teach a kid to, to get in the pool and swim faster. And with the summer coming up, this is a perfect time to talk about swimming because you know, we're all kind of starting our, our, our summer swimming schedules and things like that. Kids are, kids are getting in the pool more with the nice weather and, and, you know, we want to hurry up. They haven't, they've been maybe swimming in the off season and they get in the pool and it's all about faster, faster, faster. And they just do the stroke over and over and over. And some of it needs to be mechanics and, and teaching them, you know, how to be more efficient in their strokes so that they're not having to work their muscles so hard, but they can be more efficient in their breathing and their pulling with their arms and kicking with their legs, you know, that kind of thing. Just, just looking at their back position and their body position and core strength is oftentimes, sometimes we overuse our extremities because our core strength isn't what it should be. And, um, and so being able to develop that as well uh, can be important. So, so it helps performance as well as injury prevention. If you can, if you can take a look at the biomechanics. It seems that, um, Cicely, that cross training comes back into play you know and that's kind of been something that we keep coming circling around to you know all the way for I don't 20 years or something that that really cross training is the key to keeping and it sounds like not just for you know not just for adults but even for kids um to and like you said that not to be doing one sport like just like whether it's soccer or basketball and kids do again it's so young I mean not not even at 11 or 12 but I mean when they're seven and eight they are playing on what we call the all-star team you know or the travel team and so now it's like it becomes almost a year a year-round sport a lot of times and there's not any moderation like I loved how you said you know if your daughter is playing a lot of soccer all year round then take a season off and and take her swimming I, I just think that's great that's great advice Thank you. I, I, um, I definitely think that that's important. There was actually, you know, you talk about these kids that start at age three and, and you want your, your kid to be bigger, faster, stronger, but actually the research shows that if they do start that young and they <clears throat> play hard and they play in the off season and they, they don't take breaks and they don't do this cross training, they end up having three ACLs, you know, maybe they'll make it into college, but their bodies are really, you know, are really worn out with it um, by then. Although, you know, going into the chronic pain research and taking a little bit of a spin, some of it is attitude as well. Um, there's an interesting, <clears throat> an interesting uh, study that was done on demolition derby drivers, and, and it was mostly men, obviously, but attitude plays in in the sense that they have like 30 crashes a year, 
and they have less chronic pain than somebody who has one motor vehicle accident at 30 miles an hour. And some of it is, is really enjoying what you do. So playing sports for the right reasons. So if your parents are pushing you, pushing you, pushing you, and you don't really, you're not feeling it as much as they are, you're more likely to get injured also to extrapolate that a little bit, which I think is an interesting thing to think about. It is. Holly, what else do you have? Well, I was thinking, you know, obviously these are really interesting. This is a really interesting amount of advice sort of for younger women. Um, you know, I guess maybe going through to the next phase of life, you talked a little bit about um, pre-pregnancy, post-pregnancy, uh, during pregnancy. Now, you know, obviously once we move out of that young athlete phase and maybe some people may be doing these things in their young athlete phase or shortly thereafter, uh, how do women sort of best prepare themselves for that? And does this also link, I know you I know you talk a lot with a lot of people about pelvic health for women because it is a slightly different issue for us, sort of more frequent, I would say, than for men, I would guess. Actually, I will <laughs> defer to you on that as well. Um, so, yeah, kind of walk us through what happens down there. Here we go. Let's go, ladies. <laughs> Dive in, so to speak. Um, would you include, along with the internal <laughs> the internal organs we have in our pelvis, but also the actual pelvic structure, because that's where it relates to what, you know, had I mentioned about you know, hip dysplasia and things that it's just dealing with the, the bones in the joint. It's a, it's a really good point, actually. And I think a lot of people, you know, in this day and age, uh, we tend to look at healthcare. Everybody wants to specialize and everybody wants to be a niche in a niche market. But the problem with that is we look at the elbow in isolation. We look at sort of the down there in isolation. We look at the pelvic floor in isolation. And really, everything is connected, as we've discussed before. And you're very right. I mean, it's, it's a very good point that the hip structures and the, the hip muscles oftentimes cross into the pelvis. And the, the hip dysfunction in and of itself can can connect to pelvic floor dysfunction. So for example, you know, incontinence and issues uh, such as that or bowel and bladder dysfunction can very much be treated from externally. It doesn't necessarily have to be treated internally. Now, sometimes that's warranted, but it doesn't always have to go there. You know, sometimes you treat your hip and it turns out you no longer have incontinence when you run a, a mile. You know, so that's, that's something in a lot of my hip patients and I, I treat a lot of hip patients that I've found you know, they don't come to see me necessarily for their pelvic floor dysfunction or, or incontinence, as I said. They come to see me for hip dysfunction. And as we're talking, you know, we discuss that, well, after they run a mile, they actually start to have some, some leaking or some incontinence, and they're unable to hold it in. And, and so by treating their hip, we, we've made great strides in also uh, working, you know, to, to decrease their incontinence issues with running. So it, you're very right that it's all kind of connected in there. And and oftentimes, because it's such a sensitive topic, uh, we don't we don't even get to talk about it until, you know, they come to us maybe for something else. In my case, as a physical therapist, sometimes they'll come in for, for actual pelvic health, but sometimes they come in for hip hip problems, and and we can oftentimes fix fix some of their other issues. You know, the back is the same way. For example, you know, I, I treat a lot of healthcare professionals myself, and nurses, for example, spend a lot of time on their feet. And um, you know, I had a patient a few years ago came to me for back pain and and um, ended up she also had some incontinence with working and standing on her feet and in treating her back we were able to um, completely rid her of that of that incontinence so that's always nice as well when it you know when it happens that way wow so th so it sounds like a lot of these things can be kind of treated from the outside um, you know let's talk about pre-pregnancy getting ready let there are a lot of women who start taking prenatal vitamins the minute they go off their birth control there are women who you know stop drinking the minute they go off their birth control what can women do to actually prepare themselves as far as their physicality is concerned because a lot changes when you're pregnant right it's true um, I think I think it's a good a good point to look at patients across the life span or people, you know, women across the lifespan, because we start with our young athletes and then into the childbearing woman, peripausal women to the elderly, you know, elderly men and women um, can, can benefit from some of these things. And your body does change over time. And I do think it's good to look at it kind of like you treat um, yourself with prenatal vitamins. I've treated a lot of women, for example, they came to see me with back pain during their first pregnancy and then before they got pregnant with their second as they were preparing they came in and we got them a program together um, in order to strengthen the things that needed to be strengthened you know we do an evaluation kind of see where they're starting from do they need hip strengthening exercises do they already need to do some balancing stuff because you know you, you certainly sprains and falls and cramps and things like that 
with your ankles and your calves can be an issue. And some people have numbness in their hands when they're pregnant um, for various different reasons. And so if you can look at the predisposing factors of someone's body and prepare their body to the best of their ability, and again, looking at them as an individual and just kind of seeing what they bring to the table, you know, it would almost be like doing a panel to see which vitamins you actually needed to kind of to help you jumpstart instead of just taking a general you know, multivitamin, if you were able to say, well, you tend to be a little more anemic, so let's up your iron, or you tend to be a little less on the magnesium, so let's up your magnesium. You know, it would be kind of like that. You look at somebody and say, okay, well, these are some great things that you can do to prepare yourself and to prepare your pelvic floor. Maybe you need to do some more abdominal specific type things. Maybe you need to have more leg strength so you're not putting pressure on your back as your body changes and your balance will change when your weight goes out in front of you as, as your belly gets bigger and uh, changes the way you have to use the back of your legs to hold yourself up. And so some of those things are, are really great and you can really help somebody before, before they even get pregnant. Huh. And I was thinking about, you know, when we were doing, when I got my pre and postnatal, sorry, when I was doing my pre and postnatal certification for personal training, that one of the things we talked about uh, with women, you know, I would do a lot of balance exercise. We do a lot of ABA deduction, a lot of, you know, a lot of core strengthening, especially while we could still do core strengthening on, you know, on the mat, on the stability ball, things like that. But then more importantly, even the standing core stability to kind of help pass that. Are there some general things like that? Like women who maybe, you know, don't don't have a, a good physical therapist that they know and trust right now that they can maybe start doing uh, on their own. Absolutely. I think it's a great time before you get pregnant to start doing an exercise program because when, once you get pregnant, people are a lot more afraid to begin. You don't want to begin something new um, without, without a professional um, who's had training in, in pregnancy to assist you. They're a little bit apprehensive of doing that these days, although they always um, definitely want you to walk and, and continue exercising if you've been exercising. So it's good to start ahead of time and do things. And those muscles are exactly, you're exactly right with ABA deduction. And you want to, you know, glute for the layman, ABA deduction, opening, closing Opening and legs. closing your legs, right. <laughs> um, and preferably with your feet on the ground because you know, let's be honest, there's not a lot of functional things you do going in and out with your feet off the ground. You know, you're, you're going to be walking, your feet are going to be on the ground, you're going to be standing on one leg, you know, shifting your weight, you're going to be walking up and down the stairs, so you're going to be, you know, you're going to be getting up from a chair, so you're going to be using your, your glutes, you know, your, your buttocks muscles and, and hamstrings and your quads, and, and as Holly pointed out, you know, the, the smaller muscles in your hips your adductors and your abductors of your hips to, to help stabilize your pelvis and your hips. Uh, during the process. So that's a lot of it. And also stretching. A lot of people need to stretch their calves out to prepare because a lot of people have cramping during because their calves are working so hard to hold them up. And so I usually, depending on their feet and everything, I think it's good to, you know, start stretching your calves out to prepare for that. Um, and sometimes even just doing some breathing exercises, even something as simple as yoga can be good in advance to, to help um, get your rib cage in a good position because your rib cage actually changes quite a bit when you, you know, have that fetus pushing up up into your rib cage area and your rib cage changes. And, and then it, that can create some numbness and tingling even down your arm just from that change. So uh, some breathing exercises with, with yoga or something like that is always a good thing to start in advance too. And that helps with your balance too, balancing exercises. It's great. I love the, this, the idea of this, all this prenatal, you know, a prenatal care preparation. And just, it's, it seems like it's so progressive compared to, where our Western medicine has been, where so we've been so reactive for, you know, whatever this, maybe this whole century. I mean, I, you know, I don't know the history of medicine <laughs> that well, but it seems like we're, again, everything interesting how things circle around and that being, being, a, you know, progressive and, and treating things before they happen, ra proactive rather than reactive. That's amen. I mean, we, we definitely agree that you know, being preventative these days. And I think there is a resurgence. I mean, that's a very good point, Jill. I think there is a resurgence of the of the being proactive and the prevention and the wellness and being healthier, living longer. I think we're really, in, in some other countries, you know, they focus on that. And there's actually some research studies that have been done on um, back pain recently in places like Australia, South Africa, and other countries where they're trying a new PR campaign um, to decrease people's back pain just by putting up billboards and stuff and changing people's perception of back pain, changing their attitudes about back pain to be more preventative and think more healthy and have a more positive attitude about it rather than being, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I have a herniated disc. What do I do? What do I do? Um, 
And, and so it's definitely, I think, coming around to this country, too, now and, and some of the changes we're going to be making in healthcare in the future, hopefully we'll be able to capture more of that preven prevention and wellness. Moving into uh, the actual pregnancy, I guess, while we're talking about this, uh, how should how should your strength routine change during pregnancy? What should you do differently? Like, you know, I mean, we talked a lot. We've done a lot of talking about pregnancy on the show uh, throughout the different episodes. Obviously, you guys can go back and check out our discussion with Scarlett Reeves for that. Um, and so we, we talk about it a lot, but what are some changes that your body goes through physically that you need to sort of be prepared for, maybe even common injuries with pregnant women? It's a good question. I think, you know, one of the things is your fatigue level. Often women are very surprised by their fatigue level. And so being able to exercise at a level that um, is doable for you in the first three months, you're going to oftentimes women are more fatigued. And then um, in that middle three months, they have more energy. And then at the end, obviously, your body has changed quite a bit and, it, and your hormones are, are changing quite a lot throughout the process as well. And so um, there's different things throughout each phase that women need to be aware of. Um, and, and modifying to accommodate their fatigue levels in the beginning. And then in the middle, really capturing that middle three months, it's a great time to exercise. And again, you want to talk to your healthcare professionals because everybody's um, very different in their experience. And so you want to, you know, talk to your OBGYN and talk to your, you know, or your physical therapist or who, whoever um, is working with you, whoever's working with you on your healthcare, you want to make sure that everything you're doing is the right thing for your specific situation. But definitely, I think the misnomer of the old days where you aren't to exercise during pregnancy has really changed. And they're finding some real health benefits to exercising uh, during during pregnancy, especially as your hormones change throughout the process, you're going to have more instability and become more unstable. And so being able to to do some balancing things and strengthening things to help maintain that stability until at the end when you need yourself to be unstable to allow the baby to come out. Um, it's good to exercise throughout the process. And some of the common injuries um, that I've seen in my practice uh, throughout the times when I've treated a lot of postpartum and, I mean, uh, partum women, pregnant pregnant women is we've had a lot of sprains and strains because as I said you're, you're becoming more unstable and oftentimes your body your muscles and ligaments and tendons aren't necessarily prepared to deal with that and so you you have a lot of sprains and strains just you know losing your balance you'll sprain your ankle or you'll you know falls are common and as I said before um, a lot of back pain as well due to the changes um, with the belly coming out and your back has to compensate for that and then uh, numbness and tingling in your hands, which can often be misdiagnosed. A lot of people may think they have carpal tunnel when really what they have is changes in their rib cage that cause them more of a thoracic outlet syndrome or something like that. It's and then, thoracic outlet syndrome. Thoracic outlet. So, uh, so it's where basically your rib cage move up. You have these nerves that come out of your neck and go down your arm and there is a space up by your neck um, where your neck attaches to your shoulder and it's called your thoracic outlet and your rib cage moves up and kind of gets those nerves get pinched up in there um, and so it's more pinched sort of closer to your neck and shoulder than it actually is down in your wrist um, but everybody's different some people because of changes in fluid I mean a lot of times um, people retain fluid more when they're pregnant. And so sometimes even just the fluid retention can cause some numbness and tingling as well. And so making sure that uh, patients are talking to that, talking to their doctors about that as well, doctors and healthcare professionals. Wow, so then of course, you know, post-pregnancy, you want to pull it all back together. Any uh, recommendations there? Hold it all back. Hold it back. <laughs> yes, you, you definitely do. Um, you know, I think that the challenging thing for a lot of women is, uh, their body changes overnight, really, because the, the baby comes out and now you're extremely tired and your body's healing from uh, the process of giving birth. And now you're starting to lift the baby and the baby's growing all the time and getting heavier um, all the time. And you're lifting a child with a car seat in very awkward positions. And so, again, a lot of women don't go back to exercising quickly. And within that two year period, that's actually why I went into starting to treat pregnant, pregnant women is that I was seeing a lot of women in that two year post postpartum period with back pain. They were having severe back pain and they were coming to me and they were ending up having surgeries and things, um, you know, at the end of that two year period when they were able to start focusing on themselves again, they, you know, they maybe hadn't done anything for a couple of years because they were focusing on their new child. 
And so I was seeing a lot of a lot of back patients. And I realized that, you know, hey, we can do a lot to ward this off if people would actually exercise sooner. And in some countries, they have um, people doing exercise, you know, abdominal exercise right there in the hospital before they even get discharged. Um, and so I think I think it's a misnomer that we can't exercise right after there. There is some ability to exercise right after and it it can be really good to start to exercise but obviously it's under the care you know at, at that stage when you're healing it's under the care of a healthcare professional that um cecily that reminds me of a question that i've been wondering and um and it's kind of the perfect timing here because as women it seems like this sometimes happens after the children you know after the babies are born and yeah. sort of as that next stage um which is migraines it seems much more common for women, you know, from migraines. I don't have any personal experience um, at all with a migraine. Never, I've never even had anything like one. But it sounds just debilitating. It sounds like it just, it, you know, I'd just like to know if anyone, do you ever, does that, do people come in and is that something that you treat or that you know some of the research about? I, I do. The, the thing about migraines that are so tricky is that so many things cause migraines. I mean, that's, that's the thing that's so challenging. Um, postpartum now, they're thinking, they're thinking that, you know, hormones play a part. And frankly, a lot of, a lot, in a lot of ways, we're learning that hormones are playing a part in a lot of things, actually. So I think, I think that definitely, definitely we do see that. A lot of times, though, there's a lot of factors that cause migraines that are related to postpartum issues. You're not getting enough sleep. Sleep research, you know, right now in chronic pain is really a hot topic because they're, you know, not getting enough sleep causes or, or contributes to, I shouldn't say causes, it's a risk factor for it, contributes to a lot of other problems. And so you're sleep deprived and you're fatigued. You're not eating well, usually, a lot of times because you're not focusing again on yourself. You're focusing on making sure your child is fed and, and on other things. And so you're, you're not focusing on yourself. You're not sleeping. You're not eating. You know, you have these hormone changes that contribute to, to that. Your life has kind of changed a bit stress and anxiety are high and stress again going back to the risk factor category stress with the chronic pain population which includes migraines is in there as well or it can be depending on the research you read in in chronic pain some people have had migraines you know their whole life and then it gets worse after pregnancy and some people have had migraines their whole life and it gets better after pregnancy you know and it could be because of the hormone changes in that case but but the stress and anxiety create creates um an, another part of it so I think all of those things contribute to it being worse. You also, a lot of times, have blood blood flow changes with, you know, a lot of times with the actual birth process, you may lose blood, which contributes to it. A lot of people don't think of having a spinal and an epidural. Sometimes they'll have migraines immediately afterwards, severe migraines, and it could be something like a, a cerebrospinal fluid leak, which um, is a tear you know, they get a tear and then they're leaking cerebrospinal fluid. So if you have a severe migraine immediately postpartum, you should go directly, you know, to your healthcare professional immediately because there's a lot of things they can do right there afterwards. Um, and a lot of women think it's normal. And I think that's the other thing is just educating people that, you know, hey, they don't have to live with this pain and they should talk to somebody about it. Wow, that's, I mean, obviously now we've kind of gotten into the postpartum here, moving into more the the life stages after that. I mean, you know, for me particularly, you know, or for there may be, I'd say one third of us here has never had kids. There's a possibility that a lot of our listeners will never have kids, but there are some things that do happen to your body as you get older. As a woman, things to watch out for. Uh, where would we start with that? I mean, even as young, maybe as your 30s, I think things start to change, yeah? Yeah, I think... I think, you know, now breast health is kind of a big thing. We're coming up in June, and a lot of people are doing the Race for the Cure, and, and breast cancer awareness um, is sort of on the forefront of some people's minds. And I think making sure that we get the word out now um, about having mammograms, and after 40 now, um, they're saying, you know, depending on your risk factors, you should have a mammogram every year. I think doing self-breast exam, making sure that you're checking for anything um, different in your body. You know, if, if something doesn't seem right, you know, you're checking and you have it checked out just so that we can catch things sooner and we can treat it sooner. I think that's a big one. And I think as we move into, you know, into other phases, it's important maybe right now to mention that it's not just, you know, women's health. We, we've been trying to think of a way to rename it because it's not just women's health. I actually treat a lot of men um, who come in, you know, who have pelvic pain and back pain and, and, 
you know, they don't want to talk about it either, but it's an important issue for them. And, and some men even get diagnosed with breast cancer as well. So it's not just for women, you know, women's health is not just for women. Um, I think, and that's, I think that's an important point to make, because I think that's an education too, that men have some of these issues as well. And, um, and so as we move out, out of the pregnancy postpartum phase, it's important to include the men in that, in that pelvic health. And also, like I said, breast exams too. Um, and then as we even go throughout the lifespan a little bit further, talking about bone health, you know, bone health now is such a big topic and as we're living longer, but, but one in two people end up having some issues with their bone health, with osteoporosis. And so I definitely think exercise is a big thing, trying to go ahead and do some weight bearing exercise as you get older. And even if it's just walking, you know, um, throughout the years I've treated women well into their eighties and nineties who have you know, osteoporosis or Parkinson's or, or varying other um, diagnoses who are, you know, exercising on the treadmill. They're going, you know, I wish I could get some of my younger women to exercise as much. I mean, they do the elliptical, you know, three times a week for 10 to 20 minutes. They do the treadmill, you know, three times a week or more. Now, you know, if they could do it 30 minutes, it would be great. Um, and so that exercising every day for 30 minutes um, even weight bearing exercise. And what I mean by that is, are things like, you know, walking or things where you're standing and your bones or you have some compression on your bones, not like swimming. So it's, it's actually really interesting. And you were talking a little bit about, uh, bone health and that sort of thing, which I feel like has been, I don't know about you, Jill, but I feel like every, they always, they've been talking about that a lot for women. And I, I wonder sometimes with osteoporosis, you know, they always say to women, like women are talking about taking calcium supplements and doing sort of things to sort of treat it as opposed to, I mean, you know, as, even as younger women, I feel like there are probably some things we could do to prevent it. And then even into older age to sort of keep the bone that we have, um, you know, obviously you mentioned weight bearing exercise uh, and, you know, I, I think for older women, sometimes they think uh, you also run into an issue with arthritis and things like that. And then they're saying, well, I don't want to be on my, I just like to be in the pool because the pool feels so good. How do, how do you balance that with your patients? I think it's interesting. Um, I, I, I actually go, you know, sort of merging back into the back pain issue. Uh, it's, it's kind of a misnomer that people think, oh, well, you know, back pain actually goes down over time as you get older. After 60, we have a decrease in back pain, but arthritis continues to go up, for example. So there, there, is some, there is some misnomers and some myths out there that I think people are afraid to exercise and their fear of exercise actually plays into some of their dysfunction. You know, if they could, if we could convince and get people out there and exercising in a safe, healthy way, I, I think you, the bones themselves would be less weak and, and would be stronger. And so finding something that works for people, I think just listening to people too. I mean, if they like, you know, water aerobics, get them to do something weight bearing before and after their water aerobics, you know? And, and so kind of working within, within the person themselves and that way that'll slowly kind of decrease some of their fears and, and just kind of fit, you know, finding out what fits for people. Cause a lot of my patients, they do, they like the pool and it's great that they're willing to go to the pool and you want to support that exercise. Cause that's great for their cardiovascular health, you know, just trying to convince them to walk on the treadmill 10 minutes before and after and Hey, wow, their jo joints and, and bones even feel better when they do that. So they do both of them together. So I think some of it's just kind of working with what the patient's needs are and, and educating them on, on the research out there about, about osteoarthritis um, also, because some people think, oh, well, I'm just going to get it and it is what it is. But, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be that way. For example, there's a study that we all like to talk about from a few years ago that 100 people with no pain at all had MRIs on their backs and 50 of them showed that they had herniated discs, but they had no pain at all. So, so maybe you have a little arthritis, but it may or may not be causing you any problems or pain. Okay. That's really, it's really interesting to hear too, you know, you talk about, I, I know, I know this is something that, I, that I've talked about with, with my clients back in the day, but I know this is something, it's important for people to do the weight bearing exercise. And I often would hear my older clients say, oh, well, I have arthritis, so I can't exercise, you know, or, well, and especially I think with RA, that's a big one, rheumatoid arthritis, they're always very afraid to move more. And, you know, all the research that I read, and I don't know from what you're saying, it sounds like it, it also from your point of view treating patients is, you know, sort of the more you move, the more you can move. Yes, that is true. Definitely the, the arthritis. And, and there may be times where they can move less or more than others, and you have to respect that. Um, but I think just, just kind of 
listening to the fears and, and working around that and educating them on the research because it's definitely true that you know the more you move the, the more you move so the better the better they get that the joints bathed with fluid the better their joints are going to feel um, and a lot of a lot of patients with arthritis report that during exercise they actually feel better um, a lot of times so I think some of it's just getting the right exercise and getting tools like with RA a lot of times a lot of times patients will have pain in their hands and so they won't want to grip weights and things like that so then you go to more of a you know, a wrist weight, or we talk about, well, let's get some splints for your fingers and we can work around that to be able to grip the weights better. And so I think just sort of working with them to say, hey, it, we don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We can exercise. Let's just modify it appropriately for you. And, and people like that. They like, you know, they like to have an individual persona. They like to be individuals. And so I think listening to people's individual needs and, and addressing them and, and trying to still encourage that exercise. I mean, because some people too, they just, they, they come to a personal trainer because they need that accountability. And so they may try to say, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. But what they want you to say is, okay, well, let's do this instead. This will be great for you. And it's, that's so interesting. I think the, as you've mentioned a few times, the psychology, Cecily, of this, where you mentioned about the race car drivers or the, I mean, the, um, is it the Derby you said drivers where, you know, they have less pain than someone, you know, even if they're getting in 12 crashes a year. Uh, so attitude and the, the whole mental part of this plays in. And I guess what I wanted to ask you was about, about pain tolerance. And so in, in your profession and in, in your experience as a physical therapist, what do you feel about that? Is pain tolerance something, I mean, you know, how does that work? Like you mentioned about the people with it's a hundred people who have no back pain get an MRI and what you said, you know, the recent study that a, a percentage of them actually had a herniated disc, you know, what, what is it that differentiates person to person on that with pain tolerance? That's actually a really good question uh, regarding chronic pain, because I do a talk um, for the university and, and patients and different, different things regarding chronic pain. And there are so many factors that play into someone's pain tolerance. And I think last time we talked, I gave the example, and this is the example that really resonates with people is it's kind of like some people like cinnamon and some people like pepper, you know, pain tolerance is personal and and whether or someone, whether or not someone will have pain for a short period of time or a long period of time, it's a very personal experience. Just like someone will eat peanuts and it'll be a great source of protein for them, and somebody else eats peanuts and they almost die of anaphylaxis. It's a very, you know, it's it's the same food, so the pain may be the same, but everyone tolerates it differently because they're individuals. And there are, I, I have a diagram that I put up on my PowerPoint slide about this that there are so many different factors that play in. The injury itself plays in, obviously, and the tissue healing plays mm -hmm. in, um, as well as bone health and bone healing. And, you know, I use the word comorbidities, but if they have any other issues, you know, um, obviously, if someone breaks a bone and they have osteoporosis, it's very different than if somebody breaks a bone and they don't have any bone health issues. So there are those factors that play in as well. But along with that, your family um, history plays in, your genetic makeup, um, your your um, risk factors, your stress plays a part, behavioral issues, your attitudes about um, healing and life, and, and um, maybe even your attitudes about how you got the injury to begin with uh, play in. So there are a lot of factors uh, that, that come to play. Um, you're, you're now, you know, we talk about generational differences play a part. So there's just a ton of factors that play into whether or not one person's going to heal and how well they heal, along with attitudes, as you said. There's just, there's just a lot of factors. Whether someone smokes or doesn't smoke will play into how they, they heal. Their body weight, you know, whether they're obese or whether they tend to be, um, have a low body weight. You know, their diet now, diet is such a huge thing. I mean, what are we eating? Is there enough food in our food? And, and those kinds of things, um, vitamin D, you know, um, how much alcohol someone drinks or doesn't drink. And uh, so there's just a ton of things that really can play into someone's healing process. Well, thank you for that, um, for that very uh, fulfilling answer. <laughs> <laughs> So is that something, is, does a lot of that come from your chronic pain research as right. well? Right. Yeah, that's that's really going into the chronic, I, 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 um, I treat a lot of chronic pain and I have a real passion um, for the chronic pain population because I feel like, you know, in a lot of ways that they get lost um, in our healthcare system. So I have, I have a real, I have a real heart for that, um, that population. 
Well, so going, I mean, obviously we're talking about age things, you know, we talked, we've talked a lot recently about how uh, actually you and I, Cecily, have had a chance to talk about, this is not something we've talked about on air very much, but here we go, uh, about, you know, we, we discussed very briefly incontinence issues. And obviously as people age, especially women, this is something uh, that they, they find happening to them. And obviously this is a big issue for me going into my, my internship this summer with Kimberly Clark on the Depend brand, uh, which obviously at the Depend brand, and they have a real passion for for women's health and about educating women of sort of the or sort of the way that this happens and wanting them to still feel sexy and be active. You know, coming to that, talk to me a little bit about do women have to live with this? When you know, how does this typically happen? What are some of the symptoms? And then, of course, what maybe could we do to help prevent and or cure it once it happens? And really, again, there's so many things um, that factors that play in whether or not it's actually a bowel or a bladder issue makes it makes a difference you know are we talking about uh, the front part of the pelvic floor the back part of the pelvic floor there are a lot of a lot a lot of different muscles down there we, we tend to think of it as a floor but it's really more like a bowl and it's made up of a lot of different muscles um also just the bladder itself um and i i think diagnostic wise a lot of times people are misdiagnosed. They go in and they, they have incontinence and everybody says, oh, well, incontinence is the same thing, but it could be stress incontinence. You know, maybe they only have incontinence when they sneeze or cough, pardon the cough earlier. Um, <laughs> or they only have incontinence when, you know, when they walk um, outside, you know, or they walk too far or they, you know, sometimes people have difficulty voiding altogether. So they have, their, their problem isn't so much that it, that it leaks, it's just they have difficulty going to the bathroom. Um, and, and, and some people, they feel like they have to go, but they don't really have to go. When they sit down, they don't go. So I think vetting out sort of what are the real issues with the incontinence. And then there's a lot of things um, that I like to do. I mean, it's really about fact gathering for each person. As we discussed, there's so many factors that play in. You know, I like to have patients um, do a, 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 a bladder record. So, you know, it, it has like the time of day and they tell me when they urinate, when they had an accident, um, what activity they were doing with the accident, what they drink during the day can make a, a difference. You know, how many cups of coffee do they have? You know, you find, you know, there are some of your patients, well, you know, they're drinking three or four cups of coffee and they're 70 years old and, you know, they're, they're not really hydrating well with other fluids. And so different things like that can also play a part. And, and then you have some people who can drink four cups of coffee and don't have any trouble at all. So again, that's a very individual thing, but it's good to see on a bladder diary, when do they go to the bathroom? Do they, do they have difficulty at night? I mean, do they only have incontinence in the, in the evening versus in the morning? And that all tells you various different things, you know, um, also telling you how much they, they go to the bathroom. So when they go to the bathroom, do they feel like they go to the bathroom a lot or is it barely any at all? Um, so, so I think those things um, are important too. And then you, that helps you kind of get a sense of what's going on with them, which will help you better treat it as well. And then, you know, when do they change their pads? You know, another thing that I find with women is that um, they need some education on using their pads too. If they are, if they are at the point where they're, they're using um, some of the great products that we have, as Holly pointed out, <laughs> depends. Um, when do they change their, do they change their pads frequently or not frequently? Because there's some, you know, issues that can arise from that, uh, rubbing issues and, and other things that can occur. And, and what food they eat, not just what they drink, but what food they eat um, as well can, can play a part. So I think gathering as much information as possible. And if they are um, a postpartum woman, how many pregnancies have they had and, and what kind of pregnancies did they have? You know, a lot of women um, have difficulty with difficult pregnancies and have never really talked to anybody about it and may have been incontinent since they had that. And it's just getting worse and worse as they age. Um, so I think talking to them about, you know, did they have trouble and did they have any trauma, you know, and um, the other thing that often comes up is just trauma itself. Do they have any trauma to their pelvis? Um, you know, have they had any abdominal surgeries or, um, you know, any abuse uh, issues come in to play? Do they have frequent urinary tract infections? So I think just gathering some information, um, do they use pads? Do they use tampons for certain things uh, regarding their menstruation? I mean, there's all kinds of questions that help you sort of get to the issues of what's really going on that I like to ask. And, and so I do a pretty thorough, you know, when I'm talking to someone, um, who's who's come to me with this? I do a pretty thorough evaluation um, with them, and then some of the, some of the evaluation I have them do at home, so they can give me some information. 
Wow, that's a lot of information. My head is spinning. <laughs> um, well, Jill, do you have any other questions for Cecily about women's health? I probably have a hundred. <laughs> but well, no, shoot. No, no, but I good, bad, and different too. I would love to, Cecily. If it's good with you, maybe um, we can circle back again with you because I just there's so much. You you are you are a, just a. <laughs> you are a well of knowledge. I, I think that I feel like we covered a lot of things tonight. I think I feel like we did a nice job with covering like, you know, even like we talk about young girls, you know, and, and, and kids and sort of that overuse injuries you know, that you see and then all the way up to, you know, women and they're all sorts of ages. So I feel like we did a really nice job with that range. Um, and so I guess I guess my only my my final question would be you know, I think we've talked about everything sort of in moderation or that idea of the cross training and just, I feel like a lot of that is co very commonsensical, you know, that, uh, that people do kind of sometimes swing to trend to trend or, and, and they just don't realize that if you just mix it up a little bit and you, and you do, like you said, like if you've been running a lot or you're feeling some tweaking or then, you know, mix it up and, and go in the pool one day or, you know, I mean, whether that's for women or, uh, or even for, you know, young kids that are, that are specializing in their sports starting so early um so i don't i think i just wanted to if you would kind of finish off with some advice for for parents for kids because that you know that's where i'm at my my kids are starting to really do more and more hours of organized sports each week and i just i wonder if you what do you have to say sort of as a final thought about that and what we can do, what we can watch for girls or boys? And, um, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to hear what you said. As you, as people come in and you see, you know, the research come in as the director of research for, um, you know, is it for the American Physical Therapy Association, right, you said? Mm -hmm. uh, the director of research for the American Physical Therapy Association section on women's health. Okay, that's right. So, yeah, so I was just curious about, some some advice for for young kids and and how to how to you know keep them just keep them healthy well i think i'm, I'm gonna actually take off my research hat and actually put on my parenting hat and tell you that you know merging the things that i read and the, the patients that i see um with what you pointed out about you being a parent and and asking about parents i think i think honestly it all starts with sort of that conversation with your kids. You need to be in constant conversation with your kids um, and watching them because, you know, kids, some kids, kids are all different, just like everybody else. And, and some kids want to please their parent and they're not necessarily going to tell you, hey, my shoulder hurts. And to be honest, they may not even notice that their shoulder hurts, but you're watching them. And so being ever present at their in their lives and watching their games and watching, hey, you know what I noticed is that, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy pitches differently this week than he did last week. He's starting to do something different with his shoulder. And I noticed that. And I, you know, I want to talk to him about it and have a conversation with him about it and find out, is his shoulder bothering him? And is he doing something different? And can, do we want to get it looked at or get, get him on a great um, shoulder program or something to help with those kinds of things? So I think, I think being in communication with them and also observing them, you know, being, being present um, at those activities so you can catch things before they actually become a problem and, and kind of, you know, instead of saying, hey, let's go throw the ball around again tonight, let's say, hey, let's go swimming instead or, hey, let's go, you know, let's go just um, take a dog or, hey, let's play, you know, basketball or, hey, let's do something a little bit different tonight instead of that, just to mix it up and give, give that body part a rest a little bit. And then you may find, hey, the next time they pitch, their shoulder looks better. You know, just by even taking a rest and, and taking a break. Sometimes it's your body's way of just saying, hey, I'm fatigued. I need a break. Well, thank you. Thanks wow. for the question, Jill. So, Jill, are you down for maybe five minutes of good, bad, and different? Oh, yeah, I'm down. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so I'm going to go big on my first good, bad, and different. And this one is for Cecily because, honestly, I don't know if I know enough about it for us to make a call. We'll do our best to make a call on this first one. Um, I'm sure no one here knows that much about it, but vaginal rejuvenation surgery, Cecily, good, bad, or indifferent. <laughs> you are going big. Go big or go home, Holly. Seriously. Woo! Go big or go home. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, um, I really I really would have to look at the research on it, um, to be honest with you. And, and that's really good. Everybody sad. open Google Everybody very open, quickly. Yeah, seriously. Um, are we talking about laser? Is that what we're talking about? We're going to go G-spot augmentation as Ooh, well as vaginal reasoning. Um, you know, I, I, 
enhanced sexual gratification can't be bad. I'm, I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I think, I think it really depends on if they need it or not. You know, that's the bottom line. If they need it, they should have it. And if they don't, they shouldn't. Well, my, my real question is, before I answer, so you would say good, maybe, or mm, indifferent, possibly? Probably, because I, I wouldn't, I, I think a, a lot of times some of the things that I see is that pe- people also in this particular region down low, they they have uh, unnecessary surgeries. Like, for example, I see a lot of patients who are misdiagnosed with interstitial cystitis, and they don't need it. What is that? Well, there you go. So that's for you, good, bad, or indifferent. And so... <laughs> so <laughs> So I think I think patients can be misdiagnosed and have surgeries they don't need when less invasive treatments might have helped them. Okay, so so here so here is my question, I guess, before I make an opinion on good, bad, or indifferent. Here, you know what? I'm ju- I'm just gonna go with uh, anything that makes people feel better is good, and I'm I'm Amen. not gonna ask any questions <laughs> about anything. Um, Jill. <laughs> Amen, sister. Yeah, was such I, a, you summed it up so well. Sorry, go, Jill. Yeah, you did. No, that's true. I think um, I say good. You know, if I mean, if like like Cecily said, I mean, enhanced sexual gratification. I mean, <laughs> can you go wrong there? Well, <laughs> um, so you know, I don't really, I don't know a lot of details about it. I have, I have heard of it, and I, um, I think that probably for some segment of the population it, it it makes them makes them feel better makes them happier about you know their lives so i think it's good hey joe can i can i jump back in here and just say you know i, I know it's not my turn anymore but i i wanted to say that i i actually think getting to the bottom the issue like what's the real issue there too yeah. i think oftentimes we're looking for an answer and oh this surgery is just going to be the thing and it's just going to help me but we're not getting to the real issue of why are we not you know, going back to the, why are we not being sexually gratified? And so I think oftentimes, you know, before we jump into something invasive, we need to get to the bottom, the bottom line of why this is happening so that, so that we can ensure that whatever treatment we're giving is actually going to be the right one. Right. And it's not a wasted, yeah. It's, it's, exactly. Hmm. I, you well, know, it's to have that surgery that... and not give you the sexual gratification you were hoping for. <laughs> <laughs> that would be terrible. No, well, be- on that note, Holly, if we can just, I just want to add one more little thing about this subject before we go to our next uh, topic, good, bad, and different topic, which is this. So I, you know, I, I realized when I was 29, I was diagnosed with hip dysplasia, bilateral hip dysplasia on both sides, and it's something I was born with, you know, and they just, they didn't catch it. They weren't, in the 70s, they weren't looking closely enough at it I don't think so it wasn't I didn't catch it or my my doctor didn't catch it my pediatrician and then I had to go through a huge you know like six month long well a surgery that was every six month long recovery you know on my hip and they actually did a Oh, what they call a um, periacetabular osteotomy which means they cut your your pelvic bones and put them back together so they're no longer they don't, there's no longer a shallow um, ball and socket joint. It, it, they, they put it back together, uh, and so that's a much better functioning joint that would ho- hopefully go the distance and lead to less um, arthritis over the years. So I had that big surgery. I mean, again, like months and months of crutches and, and just rehab and, and in the pool and, and all that good stuff. And then about a year later, I went with a neighbor to hot yoga, and this was like right when hot yoga was sort of getting going. And I walk in, and I have to fill out my form and, and say if I have any you know injuries. You know, you have to have that disclaimer. So because I was a guest, so I fill out the form, and I just meant you know I so said I had a hip surgery and you know whatever, and I hand it to the yoga instructor, and she <laughs> and she looks at it and she reads and she sees that I had this big surgery. And she's like, oh, and I said, oh, yeah, it was a huge deal and had a long recovery, but my hip is so much better. And, and she looks me straight in the eye and she says, if you had been coming to yoga before that, you would have never needed the surgery. And I just, I, I mean, I was like speechless. Just, and so I don't know, I just thought of that story when we were talking about sort of un, like just that sort of uh, attitude about you know, she she had no idea what the details were, and but she she felt that. And I wanted to just look at her and say, "This wasn't muscle. Like this was not like this was bone. Like this is <laughs> something about my structure." You know that I I just thought it was funny that she just looked right at me and said that. 
Well, you know, that, that goes back to sort of what we were talking about. I mean, the specialization thing where, you know, whatever people do, that's the cure for whatever you have, you know, <laughs> you know, so, um, you, you know, I, I always with, with, you know, given hip patients is a perfect example, you know, with a patient, let's say you have a, you know, this was a patient, let's say I saw years ago, you have a patient with a stress fracture in her hip and, and you, you send her to three different experts, somebody that I know to be moderate, somebody that I know to be aggressive and somebody that I know to be conservative. And they all three will say, oh, my treatment is the only treatment. My treatment is the best treatment. My treatment is exactly what you need. And they will all tell you different treatments. <laughs> I mean, some of it's subtle, but sometimes it's, oh, you should have surgery immediately. You want to run again. You know, the aggressive guy will say, you should have surgery immediately. And then, and then you'll be on crutches. And then you'll be running again within three months. And then, you know, the conservative guy will say, no, 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 you need to be on crutches for two months. And then you need to, um, and then, and then you need to, to do therapy. And, and then you won't run for a year. And then, you know, the, the, the moderate guy may say, well, you know, let's do crutches. Let's try them for four weeks. Let's see how it goes. And then let's maybe try some therapy afterwards. Let's see how it goes. And, and maybe you'll be running within six months. You never know. You know, so every, and, but they'll all tell you their way is the only way. And so I think in that case with the yoga, you know, her thing was yoga and she clearly didn't know this, you know, that's why it's so important to listen to your people, <laughs> you know, because, because your situation is obviously very specific to you and it doesn't sound like, you know, yoga was the answer to that. All the, you know, yoga may be great for some things, but, but it right. certainly wouldn't have kept you from the issue that you had. Probably not. And yoga, I would assume that yoga could really never hurt, you know, to do so. I mean, it certainly can help, I'm sure, pre, you know, in both ways that are proactive and reactive to injuries. Um, I believe, I highly believe in yoga and wish I had more time to, to practice it. <laughs> but I think, like you said, listen to your people, Cecily, but I also want to add, you know, and listen to your body. Oh, amen. I, yeah, yeah I feel like, yeah. We know and nobody body. knows your body like you either. That's that's. I tell my patients that all the time. I'm like, you know, you're you're a a part of of the healing process. You and me and your doctor or your other healthcare professional or or just the two of us or your family. You know, we're a team to help you get better. And you're with your body so much longer than me. And because I treat chronic pain, they have, you know, a lot of my patients have tried everything. They've done everything. They know their body a lot better than I do. Coming in, so they bring me very valuable information to be to be a part of, of, you know, their journey so that I can, I can help them, but they give me a lot of information because they, you're with your body all the time, you know, and, and so it's important. The information that, that people have about their bodies is invaluable. And, you know, so I totally agree with you. I think you're right. People need to listen to their body. But in the, in the case of, of going back to the demolition derby drivers, maybe sometimes <laughs> we don't need to listen to our body so much, yeah. you know, we need to calm it down and, and maybe not let our let our injuries speak so loudly, depending on what they are. Sometimes we give them too much attention. You know, we let them power have too much power over us. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> that was a really good question. Wow. So, so do you do you have a good, bad, and different that you want to ask, Jill? Oh boy. <laughs> or Sess, if you've got one, we'd be happy to participate. It can yeah. be, it can be <laughs> uh, it doesn't have to be as uh, deep as mine, but. Okay, well, I, I mean, you know, t trailing back into what we've been talking about, you know, good. Do you think? Do you think playing year-round sports for your 11-year-old is good, bad, or indifferent? I'll jump right in. <laughs> I think it's bad. 11. I, you know, my husband and I talk about this subject a lot with our, you know, with our kids, and because my now my oldest is nine, so he's getting there, and um, I feel like when I'm watching him play baseball, or I'm, you know, and he sometimes has back-to-back -back games just because of the way the schedule is and I'm like okay he's not 14 you know like in my mind when you're gonna really specialize and get serious I, I 14 seems in my opinion to be a nice age because you're a freshman in high school and you know you may be looking to play your sport in college you may be hoping for some scholarship money but it, it, I think that much before 14 is not it's not appropriate to go year round and that you've got to you've got to try all sorts of things I mean not just sports but things in life you know and not just get sucked into playing indoor soccer travel soccer fall, spring soccer summer league I mean it's like it's endless so I say bad Gosh, I agree. I, I think I think that you know I think it's very individual too. I, like you pointed out, um, you you and your husband are talking about it. You're in communication about it, and you know your kids better than anybody, mm -hmm. right? You're communicating. Right. You're you're attending their games and 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 watching them play. And and so I think I think it sounds like you know you've got a really healthy beat on what's best for your family and and your kids. And I think that that's 
you know, that's very valuable. I, I mean, I, I don't know. It's difficult for me to say because I think, I mean, I, it wasn't long after 11 that I started sort of year-round sports. I mean, we typically mixed it up. We did, you know, different sports for different seasons. But you wonder sometimes, because I know, like, the kids who ended up getting really serious, I think some of them maybe started that young. And, and I also feel, you know, we talked about this before, girls who play sports early. I guess maybe this was, this would be cheerleading for me. I probably started specializing in cheerleading that early. I'm not saying that hasn't led to its own slew of problems <laughs> later in life, both emotionally and physically, but um, possibly mentally. Um, <laughs> But maybe the successes are balanced with the terror. Um, I mean, um, other stuff. And um, but but I think basically the point I'm getting to is I think they can be good. I think they can teach uh, mm-hmm. young children of all ages. But you know, obviously for this for the purpose of this podcast, girls, but could be boys too. A certain responsibility, uh, expectations of other people. I know people that did sports with me certainly have very high so have very high level of social skills, especially if they did it when they were younger. They tend to be a little less selfish in some of their later in life decisions because they sort of have that team mentality. It's not good for the team. It's not good for the whole. Whereas I have noticed that some kids who maybe didn't participate in team sports sometimes have trouble with what people expect of them. Um, whereas people who, who do sports, especially team sports, have a very good idea of how the whole depends on your personal actions, which I would say for that reason, it might be good. I agree. I think Teamwork, I think teamwork is really a a valuable skill that a lot of people who play organized sports, team sports, gain. Um, And and like Holly said, I mean, all the valuable things that go with that, you know, learning to to, um, handle successes as well as failures. I think that's very valuable. I I think the important thing is just from a physical standpoint is is selecting, when you're talking about your kids anyway, selecting um, sports that that go with their skill set. So, for example... You know, if you have um, kids that are particularly a certain size, may or a certain a certain you know, some kids have um, propensities to be good at good at endurance sports, and others more strength sports. So, also kind of seeing your child's strengths and weaknesses, and maybe you'll want to get them in some things to fill in those weaknesses. Like Holly said, like if your child needs to learn how to share, you get them in a a social team building act, uh, sport where they learn about teamwork and they learn how to share. Um, if your child maybe, you know, is particularly small or particularly tall, you may want to focus on sports that cater, you know, that, that are kind of a good fit for those activities so that they're not going to be putting their bodies in situations that are, that are far reaching for their bodies necessarily. So what do you think, Cecily, have been different? Uh, sports? Oh, you said bad. No, so it was you, Jill. Oh, wait, no. no. Do we I get said, No, I felt, yeah, I think we wrapped it. I think that. I think so. we're oh, you didn't say bad? I don't think so. I Sorry. think I said it depends. <laughs> uh, see, you I was bad. I was for everything. I can't. I can't form an opinion on something. I got to be. I'm just gotta commit. Yeah, you got to commit. Yes. Kind of commit. We're, we're super, super strict on this show, right, Jill? <laughs> <laughs> Very strict. <laughs> oh. Well, Cecily, thank you so much for all, like, just the tons of information and, and you and you also deliver it so well and con- clearly and it's just enjoyable to to learn from you and have you on the show and i can't wait to do it again well thank you jill i just appreciate you and holly for having me and i just love being with you and uh enjoy it thank you all right so that's it for this week on crashing glass have a great week everybody yeah yeah thanks